Hello and welcome to this very short lecture on Hobbes and Locke. Just to sort of iron out a few um, p possible misunderstandings, maybe about their differing views on the state of nature, uh, how this links to their views on human nature, uh, the social contract and the state. So Hobbes and Locke were 17th century English philosophers whose writings were greatly influenced by the tumultuous events of that period, such as the Thirty Years' War across Europe and the civil war between King and Parliament in England. They wrote on similar themes, such as what would life be like in the state of nature and what was the appropriate relationship or social contract <coughs> between a state, a government and its people. But they reached very different conclusions, with Locke being widely viewed as the founding father of liberalism, whilst Hobbes is seen as greatly influential on conservative thought. So, to begin with, the state of nature refers to human societies in a time before formal government or law existed. And both thinkers used this, this idea as a conceptual tool on which to base their political philosophy. For Hobbes, life in the state of nature would be, to use his famous phrase, nasty, brutish and short. Essentially, life without government would consist of a permanent war of all against all, with no laws or formal punishments to keep people in line, disorder, chaos and bloodshed would reign. And this view reflected Hobbes' pessimistic view of human nature. Hobbes believed that people's capacity for reason was fragile at best, and that their actions were more likely to be motivated by such base desires as greed and lust uh, than by rationality. And that is why, when left to their own devices, people, Hobbes believed, would simply run riot. For Locke, on the other hand, life in the state of nature would be relatively benign and harmonious. Locke had a much more positive view of human nature, believing that people were innately rational creatures with a natural God-given sense uh, of, of right and wrong, expressed through the idea of natural law. In the state of nature, therefore, he argued people would generally respect one another's natural rights, understanding that it was in their own self-interest to do so. Life in the state of nature, therefore, was for Locke not nearly such an unbearable prospect as it had been for Hobbes. For Hobbes, because life was so intolerable in the state of nature, people would naturally want to get out of it as soon as possible. They would, therefore, he reasoned, be willing to give up pretty much all their freedoms for some kind of order in which life would become bearable. Indeed, they would have to, for the kind of state that would be necessary to impose order on such an unruly mass would have to be strong and authoritarian, a leviathan in the words of his 1651 book of that name. The social contract envisaged by Hobbes then imposed very few obligations on the state, indeed really only two, to impose order and not to actually murder its own citizens. So long as it did this, the people had a duty to obey it and no right to rebel against it, however cruel and unjust its rule might be. This was because for Hobbes, chaos was always deadlier than tyranny, and rebellion would always lead to chaos. Revolt and revolution always threatened a return to the brutal state of nature, which for Hobbes was to be avoided at all costs. For Locke, however, because life in the state of nature was essentially okay, um, the people would expect a lot more from a government if they were to give up their freedoms in order to establish one. For Locke, rational beings would seek a state, but only if it was an improvement in, on life in the state of nature. Locke believed that although people generally respected one another's natural rights in the state of nature, these could be enhanced by the existence of laws and government. For Locke, then, the purpose of a state was not merely to impose order, but to uphold people's natural rights to life, liberty and property. This was its sacred duty, and if it did not do this, it had no right to exist. And indeed, the people had the right to overthrow it by force of arms. This was the reasoning which, which Locke used to justify the so-called glorious revolution against the English King James II in 1688. But its legacy is all around us. Locke's liberal justification for revolution against a state which does not uphold the rights of its citizens is the foundation, for example, of the right to bear arms in the US Constitution, as well as the justification for many of the West's wars against the Global South, such as the NATO bombing of Libya in 2011.